Good afternoon and welcome to our limitations on commercial tenancies in the time of COVID-19 webinar with Hunter Jeffers. My name is Kristen Austin and I'm your education manager at the Commercial Brokers Association. As we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to mention. To minimize external noise, all attendees are muted. However, we highly encourage questions and comments. If you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A forum, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. In the Q&A forum, you will be able to upvote questions. We were able to open up the webinar to more than 100 attendees, so upvoting will help us prioritize your questions. If you can't access the Q&A forum, please email your questions to register at commercialmls.com and we will enter them for you. If you are having technical difficulties with the webinar, please call 1-888-799-9666, extension 2, for Zoom tech support. We should be able to help you maneuver through any troubleshooting options. However, due to increased volume at Zoom, you may not be able to get through. If this happens, try logging out of the webinar and logging back in. We are recording the webinar and it will be available on demand at SEBA later this week. Without further ado, I will turn this over to our presenter, Hunter Jeffers, an associate attorney at Stoll Reeves. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, I will switch over to my slides right now. All right, there we are. Well, welcome everyone and thank you for tuning in. Um, Welcome back to my home. This is this is my new office. Um, last time, which I guess has been at least a couple of weeks uh, ago or so, we focused mostly on commercial brokerages and what brokers individually can do underneath the governor's guidance. Um, this is a little bit different. This is in response to both the city of Seattle and uh, the state of Washington uh, proclamations and ordinances talking about what landlords and tenants can do. Um, and so right off the bat, it's, it's a different question. Instead of me trying to help our brokerage community um, with their own actions, uh, we're all, now we're trying to help the brokerage community be informed about what their clients can and cannot do, uh, either as landlords or tenants. With that comes the obvious point that um, Brokers should be very careful in advising their clients what to do here. As you'll see, as we kind of work through this, there's a lot of uncertainty still, um, especially at the state level where there were not many specifics relevant to commercial landlords and tenants. Um, there was just one sentence added saying, oh, this also applies to commercial properties. Um, so we're sort of left to kind of not necessarily uh, invent gray area, but at least acknowledge that it's there. And in doing so, uh, certainly the brokerage community should be very careful and uh, be eager to loop in legal advice for their own protection, um, also for the both best interest of their clients. So uh, I'll, I'll, again, as I did last time, kind of mention that as we go through. Um, I'm going to try and focus on the commercial side of things since this is the Commercial Brokers Association. So looking at commercial tenants uh, more than residential tenants. Uh, however, um, there are buildings classified as commercial real estate, which have residential dwellings in them. And that is multifamily. That is usually four units and up. And so I will certainly kind of explain what we know about the limitations on residential landlords and tenants. I'm more than willing to, uh, to answer questions on that. Uh, that's not something I'd say I'm a supreme expert on, but I, I think I'm as familiar with it as we can be based on what we have. Um, so without any further ado, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Here's my information, uh, which I include um, more for my contact information, uh, certainly not to advertise that photo, which I don't like, but uh, my phone number's there, my email's there. Last time, many people followed up with me directly. You can also follow up with SEBA, uh, and I'm more than happy to answer anything I didn't get to or didn't answer the right way or enough, um, at least the best that I can and also help, uh, happy to help with your clients if, if that is. So it's just my name, Hunter.Jeffers at Stoll, and there's my uh, direct line as well. Okay, so our agenda today is to start with the state. We'll start most broadly with what the state of Washington has done um, and what that means for everybody. 
And of course that takes precedence even over the city of Seattle um, and the more specific limitations we've seen there. Um, on the state level, it's mostly residential. It's uh, so managers and owners of, of properties that have dwelling units, residential dwelling units that are housing people who live there have a lot to keep in mind uh, and a lot more restrictions. There's one limitation on the, on the state level for commercial owners and managers to be aware of and we'll touch on that as well. Uh, the city of Seattle is different, uh, as you may know, and we'll touch on that in the second half of this webinar, um, hopefully right around the 1030 mark. Um, the city of Seattle has done some of the similar things in terms of a moratorium on residential evictions and what can be done in residential leasing practice and property management, uh, but it also has uh, an extensive list of uh, regulations, I guess you'd say, that apply to small businesses and nonprofits. Um, and those are defined differently depending on which ordinance we're talking about. So not, not real straightforward. Um, but the idea is we'll touch on the more specific uh, jurisdiction later in the second half of the webinar and the more general state first since the state's applicable to everyone and then the city of Seattle area might be applicable uh, to less people. Uh, I do want to acknowledge, I kind of already said this, but this is extremely fluid, just like it was a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, I know for a fact that, that we're going to hear something more from the governor soon, uh, it, partially because the stay home, stay healthy order is due to expire in early May. And in some fashion, that's going to be extended. I don't think we know how yet. Um, but there's a lot, there are a lot of dialogues going on right now with the governor's office about expanding what commercial brokers can do. Um, and also to get guidance on what we're talking about today and specifically the commercial element of what the governor's proclamation included. Um, and so today I will simply say that, that this is unclear and we're looking for guidance when that's applicable. Um, but th this could come as soon as this weekend. It sounds like it could come as soon as tomorrow. And at that point we'll know more and hopefully I haven't said anything wrong, but um, we'll certainly at least have more detailed answers for the areas that appear to be a bit unclear. Uh, the final point there is just to note that I cannot, I am engaged as an attorney for the Commercial Brokers Association. So by giving this presentation, I'm not giving you legal advice. I'm trying to give information on what's out there and what it might mean and, I, and, and what it might mean for different scenarios. Um, so certainly don't rely on that as your own legal advice as a broker. Call me, call anyone you want to, and get a lawyer you want to engage to get specific legal advice for you. And similarly, don't pass it on to your client as legal advice because then you're giving legal advice um, and it's coming from someone that uh, doesn't represent that client. Okay, uh, state of Washington. So similar to a couple of weeks ago, I plan to kind of walk through what the regulations are, what they say, that's the most important thing because that's what we have to go off of. Um, and then I will answer the questions that were submitted beforehand uh, in order at the end of this, each segment, the state of Washington segment, the city of Seattle segment. And I'll try to be thorough and going through those uh, methodically. Other questions that come in um, during the presentation via the Q&A feature, once I'm done with the, the questions that were submitted ahead of time, I'll switch over to those and go through those as well. Um, if City of Seattle questions come up during this time, I'll wait to answer them until later, but hopefully uh, we'll be able to get to all your questions. Okay, so here's a general timeline um, of what we've seen at the state level. It started in February where the, when the state of emergency was declared. And then relevant to what we're talking about today, at least we've seen a series of proclamations that started with a statewide moratorium on residential evictions, uh, progressed to the stay home, stay healthy order, which was later extended uh, and may expire in May 4th, on May 4th. And then on April 16th, we saw the residential eviction moratorium extended uh, as well. And so what does that moratorium say? Um, so here it is. These are the main points of the statewide moratorium on residential evictions. It was first enacted in March. It says that landlords, residential landlords, are prohibited from serving a notice uh, of unlawful detainer uh, for failure to pay rent. They are prohibited from issuing notices. Oh, sorry. Notices of unlawful detainers, so notices to pay, notices 
um, of lease termination, things like that, or notices that unlawful detainer is going to be commenced. That's the way those actions work. You essentially give notice ahead of time uh, with all the pleading, so that's not allowed. There is a carve out, as you can see there, for landlords to attach an affidavit um, attesting that it's necessary for the health and safety uh, of other individuals. And that's, a, I think, a pretty high burden to reach, or at least that should be assumed. Um, and so a significant showing would be necessary uh, in order to satisfy that. And then you've not only got to satisfy it for the sake of not being liable for violating the proclamation, but then convincing the courts uh, to act as well and convincing a judge to, in this sense, uh, weigh the equities in your favor uh, and then convince the sheriff to carry it out. In King County, the sheriff's not carrying out evictions right now. So there are a lot of levels by which you would need to demonstrate um, that, that this is, is truly necessary under the circumstances and the key words are health and safety, not economic. Uh, moving on, residential landlords are prohibited from initiating judicial action. That's sort of covered from before, or at least should be expected. And you'll see there that local law enforcement uh, is prohibited from acting on residential eviction orders as well. So that moratorium was then extended in mid-April and it was also amended. So there were some, there are some new terms here. Um, some new language. This is the one that came down most recently, uh, prompting this webinar, frankly. Um, and here's what that said. So A, it's a little vague. Um, when it introduces the restrictions that apply, it says that it applies to residential and commercial properties. However, um, all but one sentence of what is provided discusses dwellings, discusses residences. And those terms, um, pursuant to the proclamation are defined by the residential landlord tenant law. And so when it says dwelling, that is interpreted and defined as a residential dwelling where someone is living. So for that reason, and that's the terms that used throughout the order, for that reason, we believe that despite that opening sentence, all these restrictions apply only to residential landlords, uh, except for the one sentence that specifically calls out the commercial properties, which I'll mention in a second. So that's our interpretation, I would say. I think that's the common sense interpretation. I'll say it's something we would like to have confirmation on, um, but that's how we are interpreting it. So with that being said, we see a little more detail on similar subjects as came out in March. Residential landlords cannot serve, uh, force, or even threaten notices requiring residents to vacate a dwelling. So here it's not just tied to rent. It's also a notice to comply or vacate. And again, we see the same qualification, unless it's necessary to respond to a significant and immediate risk uh, to the health or safety of others. Uh, similarly, residential landlords cannot seek, enforce, or even threaten judicial eviction. And I would encourage everyone to use, uh, to interpret the, the word threaten very broadly. Um, your communications with the tenant must be accommodating they cannot be threatening um, any sort of action by the landlord uh, because it's not allowed right now. And as we'll see in a little bit, there are enforcement mechanisms to these proclamations that are being followed up upon uh, by the Attorney General's office. Again, local law enforcement's prohibited from acting on the eviction orders, same qualification for the risk uh, to health and safety of others. Residential landlords cannot assess or threaten late fees or other charges for late payment of rent after the emergency was declared on February 29th. Uh, they cannot assess rent, which is interesting. If a resident's access or occupancy was prevented because of coronavirus, um, and they cannot treat unpaid rent as uh, an enforceable debt or obligation. Um, there is an interesting carve out to this that could be relevant. I don't think now, but down the road as a landlord tries to, uh, you know, as we have sift through what happens at the end of this moratorium, the end of this emergency with tenants who haven't been able to pay, landlords who need the money. Um, this does provide a qualification that, that at least uh, gives importance to a landlord to reach out, provide a reasonable repayment plan under the circumstances, which takes into account what the tenant can or cannot do, also takes into account what the landlord can or cannot do. Um, what sort of pressure is the landlord under from their lender? 
And if the tenant refuses to negotiate in good faith with that offer, um, that's the carve out that may allow a residential landlord to later treat unpaid rent as enforceable debt or obligations. Um, in the meantime, that might be allowed too, uh, but we are advising caution uh, on any sort of actions like that during this time. Finally, we get to residential landlords cannot increase or threaten to increase rent or the amount of any deposit. And quite frankly, this is the this is the meat. Um, we'll see a lot of the questions are on this. I imagine a lot of your questions that have not been submitted are on this. What does that mean? Um, what does that mean in terms of operating expenses? What does that mean in terms of scheduled rent increases under the lease? What does that mean in terms of renewals, subleases, et cetera? Um, so we'll discuss some of those examples and I'll give the insight that I can. Um, commercial landlords, and here's the one sentence applicable to commercial landlords, and it's within the same paragraph. It says they are also prohibited from threatening to increase rent or the amount of any deposit if the commercial tenant was materially impacted by COVID-19. And it appears they're defined in that even. So if the tenant and uh, the owner is personally impacted and un unable to work or the tenant was not deemed essential uh, and therefore needed to close. So that's a big one. Um, that's, that's what prompted this webinar in many ways. Um, that's if you have commercial tenants and you're not in the city of Seattle, that's the one that you need to pay attention to. Um, and we'll get into some examples to try and help that make sense. Um, enforcement, I did wanna to touch on this. So the proclamations all state that a violation of the proclamation is a gross misdemeanor. So that's criminal. Um, we've seen very recently on April 20th, the, the Attorney General Office announced a suit against the property management company for violating uh, these proclamations. Um, in that instance, uh, it is alleged that the company issued notices to pay or vacate to 14 residents. And even though a cover letter acknowledged the eviction moratorium, so they knew it was there, they supposedly posted these notices. Um, and so, a, we see the Washington Attorney General moving very quickly and aggressively to enforce this, which is interesting. Um, and B, I think what might even be more interesting is the number of complaints and the response there too for the AG's office. So down there, you see they announced they had 650 complaints filed since April 1st, uh, which is a lot. And what's also impressive is that the Attorney General has followed up on those by contacting 469 tenants and 284 landlords. Uh, so the, the attorney general's office is aware of these things, is extremely active. Um, so it's worthy to be on this webinar. It's worthy to be reading these proclamations yourself. We can provide those um, because it takes, there's a form online and it takes one tenant uh, to submit a complaint to, to really bring the attorney general's attention. Um, and so anything proactive you can do to ensure compliance is certainly worth it. I include one final bullet point there that I've now had a couple people ask me about, which is, is this a potential class action? Um, I think that's an easy word to start throwing around um, that has a lot of complexities to it and we just don't know, but it is worthy to think about civil liability in terms of uh, a bigger landlord with a lot of tenants uh, probably needs to pay more attention than, than even smaller landlords because uh, they have more tenants being impacted by whatever decision that they're making. So the main takeaways from that um, are that proclamations statewide at least are very much focused on residential tenants. Residential landlords cannot do, a, a vari cannot do various things, including increase rent, charge late fees, threaten eviction, things like that. But commercial landlords too have something to deal with and they cannot increase rent for businesses closed due to COVID-19. And that, frankly, that's all we have to go off of. You'll see the city of Seattle has more detail. I would have even liked more than that um, for what this means and how we interpret it. But that's, that's what we have to go off of. That's why we're doing this webinar in many ways so that we can acknowledge that and, um, and help, hopefully help the members um, understand sort of what is vague about it and, and what do we do in response to that. Okay, so I'll get into the questions now. Uh, that's those. That's the main uh, the main proclamations to be. Those are the main proclamations to be aware of. Um, I 
the same caveat, be really careful with this information. This is not me providing you legal advice and this should not be you providing your client uh, legal advice. So be very careful advising clients what they're allowed to do and advising them what they're allowed to do under a government proclamation is giving legal advice. Um, so be very careful about that and refrain from it wherever possible and, and work with a lawyer to, to solve these problems. This, this is something that we're all trying to understand together. Okay, what is, first question, what is residential and what is commercial under this proclamation? So that's pretty straightforward, I believe. Um, I said it earlier, it's defined by the Residential Landlord Tenant Act, which says residential properties are essentially any home or structure or place that's being used by people um, to sleep uh, for, or for household purposes. So single family residences, units of multiplexes, units of apartment buildings, mobile homes, Airbnbs, we think, um, anything where someone's living there, assume it applies. And then commercials, basically everything else, uh, specifically uh, tenants. So I'd say focus on the tenant, not the property in this case. What's the tenant doing? Is the tenant living there? It's residential. Is the tenant conducting a business? That's commercial. Does the governor's proclamation, which bans rent increases, apply to a scheduled rent increase, apply to scheduled rent increases per a rent rider of a fully executed lease? Scheduled rent increase is to occur April 2020 for a commercial tenant. Okay, this is a great question and we got a lot on this. Um, so I'm, you'll see different, different iterations of this, I think, going forward. Uh, but frankly, this is the million dollar question and the, the governor's order is not clear, period. We're looking for guidance. We're interpreting it the best we can. I would caution you to interpret it um, broadly and in favor of the tenant to the greatest extent possible because I think that's what the courts will do. I think that's what the, the government will do. I think that's what the press would do. Um, to me, personally, in reading the governor's proclamation, um, I think rent increases pursuant to a lease that's already in effect should not be a violation of the governor's order. Um, that's my understanding of it, because the landlord is not unilaterally threatening to increase rent or um, providing lease amendments to increase rent or deciding, frankly, to increase rent. This is something that was agreed upon by the landlord and tenant in advance before this uh, civil emergency, state of emergency was declared. And all leases include some accommodation for rent to go up or down a bit, whether it's a triple net lease uh, that includes operating expenses within the definition of rent, or whether it's a gross lease that has, or a triple net lease that has either monthly or yearly increases, uh, either by specified amount or by 3%, cost of living, whatever it is. Um, so to me, it, it seems wrong, frankly, that a lease that's already in effect with a scheduled increase pursuant to a rent rider, as it says here, um, but whatever form, to me, that is, that is not increasing rent in violation of the governor's proclamation. But like I said, it is unclear. It does not say, unlike the city of Seattle, unless, you know, unless pursuant to a lease already in, fact, in effect, those words are in the Seattle ordinance. Those words are not in the governor's ordinance. So there is a clear argument that any increase in rent by whatever means or whatever methods is, an, is on its face an increase in rent. If I was representing a tenant in a tough spot that couldn't do that and I was forced to go to court, that's an argument I would make. And I think it's by its letter of the law, it's persuasive. And then we have to take into account the, the likely sympathy uh, for tenants under this situation and less sympathy for landlords typically uh, in the court system, uh, depending on what the landlord's circumstances are. So uh, not, I'm not the most black and white answer for you. Certainly is, is why your client should be talking to a lawyer, should engage your lawyer on your client's behalf um, to weigh in on this. Uh, and so unless and then your client's lawyer can interpret it for your client and decide which of these two arguments and decisions they feel comfortable with, or if it's neither, then you wait for further guidance from the governor, again, which we might get tomorrow, which we might get on Monday, which we might get next week. I thought we might get it before this. Um, so this is a, a big question that we're hoping to know more about, and I hope hearing how I look at it, what I think about it, and what the counter argument is, is at least somewhat helpful uh, even if it doesn't give you the black and white answer that we would all like to receive. 
For commercial leases, what do landlords do if a new lease that had a half month of rent due for one month before the order is issued or a free month of rent, and now the lease rate is supposed to be a full month of base rent? Do we abide by the lease or is it rent free until June or July? So good question, totally different context, but same, same question. And again, I'd say it's unclear, but to me, this is even more persuasive um, that what the parties agreed to before the, the state of emergency is not now some increase in rent that's being enacted by the landlord. It is pursuant to an agreement already in place. Uh, there was not an agreement for free month for the end of the month. Um, none of the proclamations say that a, a tenant can live uh, rent free, um, except for there's one, one statement that says, uh, as you saw, residential tenants who are unable to access their property because of COVID-19 uh, cannot be charged rent. Uh, but to me, again, I'd say the same thing. It's, it's, to me, it seems unfair and not what the governor intended um, to eliminate an agreed upon lease provision, which is what that would be. However, there's a clear argument to the, to the contrary. Um, it, it is a rent increase, period. It's more than they were paying before. Um, it's more than they were paying last month. And so there's very certainly risk here for your client. They need to talk to a lawyer, need to wrestle with this and find out what they as a landlord are comfortable with based on the legal advice they receive and make the best decision they can, which again, might be waiting for future further guidance from the governor. That's something that we've seen time and time again, the governor being willing to do is follow up and provide a little bit more information. Uh, this looks similar. If a commercial tenant has a rent increase for April, May, or June, which is spelled out in the lease document, can we make that increase? It is similar. In the event that we cannot incorporate the increase, which is spelled out in the lease document, can we retroactively bill for the increase in July or does that increase only go in effect after June 4th? So I see the bullet points are a little messed up and I, but I'll, I'll save uh, preaching the same thing over again. Uh, it's unclear to me if it's already in the lease, I think it should be allowed to uh, go into full, full force and effect, but there's a clear argument to the contrary. And I'm just afraid there's no other answer that I can that I can give based on interpreting what's been provided because there there is nothing else that's said, uh, which is frustrating. Uh, but again, we can wait and hear wait to see if we hear more. Um, the second part of this question: In the event that we cannot incorporate the increase, which is spelled out in the lease document, can we retroactively bill for the increase in July? Um, that sounds to me like accruing fees or late charges or I'm a little uncomfortable with that. I think you're, you have at the end, when this moratorium is lifted, the rent that was due during this is largely still going to be due um, except for special circumstances. And so you, 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 I wouldn't say you can retroactively bill it, but rent that is unpaid, that is owed pursuant to the lease, um, is should still be due unless you have a circumstance like a tenant being unable to access their property. Suppose there's a utility bill back, can we charge that? Um, the answer is yes, um, assuming it's provided for by the lease. I think it gets interesting and a little more frustrating when you think about whether those utilities um, or property taxes exceed what last month's triple net expenses were. I think the lease clearly uh, ex ex expects that the tenant to pay the up and down and what they actually are. That's the whole basis of triple net lease. Um, but frankly, if they exceed last month and you're charging more, I think your client needs to be aware that, that there's an argument that's a rent increase. Um, all leases that I'm aware of, at least on the commercial side and the triple, tenant, uh, triple net side, um, it expressly include payment of operating expenses within the definition of rent. And that's for very many important reasons, but mostly because if they don't pay it, it then constitutes a failure to pay rent, uh, which allows you to proceed with unlawful detainer. Uh, but that means in this context, failure to pay utility or charging more in utilities expenses is technically charging more in rent. Uh, so that's something your client absolutely needs to be aware of and it's their own risk tolerance decision on the advice of counsel as to how they want to proceed with this. 
Uh, once the restrictions are lifted, how do we calculate late fees on past due rent? From what date do we calculate them, the month in which they were originally due, or is there a new due date set based on the date the restrictions are lifted? So the state moratorium is effective on residential evictions till June 4th. So late fees cannot start to accrue. That means that doesn't mean you can wait to charge them until then. It means you cannot accrue late fees until amounts are outstanding once this moratorium is no longer effective. Right now, that's June 4th. Um, that might be extended. And you'll see Seattle is much different. They have a longer period after that that we'll touch on uh, soon. If a commercial tenant has not paid rent this month because their business is not considered essential and therefore they're forced to close and they don't have the money to pay rent next month, what steps can the landlord take against the tenant? This one makes me nervous. I'll say that right off the bat um, because it's just, it's not a great time for commercial landlords to be prosecuting evictions, period. Um, courts are largely closed or at least slowed down and there's gonna be a lot of sympathy for the circumstances. And it's viewed sort of collectively as there's a lot we don't know yet. We don't know what relief is gonna be available. We don't know how long this is going to go. Um, so patience has generally been the most often give, uh, most often legal advice. Um, but what I'd say is outside the city of Seattle, commercial landlords, uh, there's nothing prohibiting them from being able to proceed as normal with an issuing a notice to pay. Um, just, be mindful of the lack of sympathy that shows. And if, certainly if you have residential tenants, you, you cannot do that. Um, and this may similarly be updated by what we hear uh, from the governor in the, in the near term. If commercial tenants want uh, to get out of a legally signed contract, what is the usual penalty for the tenant? And what's the best way for the landlord to deal with the situation? So it's in real specific, it's a very specific situation in which tenant wants to get out of the contract. I cannot give my legal advice to that tenant on what they do. I can tell you generally the way it works that you look at the lease, the lease will usually spell out everything the landlord's allowed to recover uh, in the fall provision at the end of the lease. Um, it's limited by Washington law, which says that a landlord only gets a re you know, can't spend an unreasonable, reasonable amount of time looking for a new tenant or ask for unreasonable things like whatever that is. Uh, but keep in mind, and now under these circumstances, it's going to be very hard for a landlord to find a new tenant. Um, and that's not going to be hard to prove. And they might have to offer significant concessions for that tenant. And so, Typically, a landlord is allowed to collect expenses associated with finding a new tenant and the rent during the period it takes for them to get a new tenant in place and paying. Um, so keep that in mind uh, as you, as your client, through this, you need to talk to a lawyer and discuss what they can do uh, in terms of reasonable options for finding a new tenant. I see some hands going up. Um, Go ahead and if you have a question or something you want to say, go ahead and submit it to the Q&A. I see we've got four uh, questions lined up, which we'll get to. Uh, there's only a couple more of these. We'll see if the attorney's draft language that can be used in a lease agreement extension current lease expiring soon to allow for an increase once they are allowed. Um, I mean, we are evaluating all potential forms that are appropriate. Sometimes more forms are often more forms is not helpful. Um, and they're so, these situations are so specific that they really need their own, the clients need their own lawyer. Um, right now, we do not feel like it's right time for a form that's um, anticipating future contract, uh, future rent increases, things like that. Um, but that being said, once it's lifted, a traditional extension should be appropriate. And as this progresses, we'll keep this in mind. We'll keep thinking, you know, is there something for some jurisdictions that's helpful? Uh, and we'll do that accordingly. Okay. The tenant does not pay rent or a lower amount and the lease ends before the end of the emergency. Does the tenant automatically go into a month to month and then can landlord raise the rent? Um, so this depends on the lease, I would say. Um, can, ends before they emerge. Yeah, so this, this, this depends on the lease. Most likely, yes. Um, most leases do this. That's the operation of laws. Automatically, it would likely become a month to month. But it raises a lot of really interesting questions. 
um, not least of which is does holdover rent apply? Because you know we were talking earlier about a scheduled rent increase is provided in the lease. That seems to me like that should be allowed and be enforceable, but it's also a rent increase. So it seems like a violation of the governor's uh, words. So if we look at this holdover tenant too, uh, that you know that is in the lease already. That says if you stay past lease expiration, you're paying 150 percent, 200 percent of rent. And there's a clearly, clearly a strong argument that that applies. But equally so, there's a strong argument that that constitutes an increase in rent in violation of the governor's order. Uh, so again, we don't know. It is unclear. You can assume that a tenant would go on month to month, but your, your client should be working with a lawyer to look at the lease and understand the terms of that and confirm that's the case. Um, confirm it's not a lease that automatically extends for some reason. Um, and assuming it does, uh, a landlord should not be increasing the rent on its own. Um, again, remember we have to, we have it, with in rent increases, it applies to commercial and residential. So it's less uh, important to really worry about the distinction there, but it still should be done. Um, still ask yourself that question right away, but a landlord cannot insist on a, a, a different rent amount increase as for this month to month. Um, I think the safest route would be what was in effect last month um, an aggressive landlord might insist on holdover rent, at which point you have a disagreement um, that would, you know, who knows where that goes, but just try to negotiate something. And I think both sides have an argument here and we don't have enough guidance from the governor to know which one is right. Um, this is a good example before when I said, it seems to me, it seems fair to me that a scheduled rent increase would, would still go into effect. Now this is a, flip, a, a different side of the equities for the same argument. It doesn't seem fair to me that a tenant should start, should start to pay 200% and hold over rent when they might not be able to find a new space. They might not be able to hire a broker to go get one. Um, they might be stuck and they might not have any money to put a deposit down on a new lease. Um, so should they, should they be charged 200% hold over under these circumstances? I would argue no. And there might be a force majeure argument there. Um, and so it just, again, is, is explanation that, or sorry, is, is evidence that we don't know and that these arguments are legal arguments that need to be looked to and they're all the circumstances and try to do what's fair and best. Uh, if a tenant does not pay rent, can the landlord refuse to extend on that basis? If a landlord puts off the extension decision until after the civil emergency based on the fact uh, that they cannot raise rent, can the landlord then refuse to extend on the basis? So again, residential or commercial, that's big. We don't know here. Um, I refuse to extend doesn't mean a lot in the residential context to me because landlords cannot evict tenants. Uh, so they don't have a choice, frankly, um, whether to extend. It's just a question of the terms. Um, with commercial landlords outside of the city, it's kind of similar. In King County, there's no evictions, and evictions just aren't going to be viewed as nice right now. Um, but, you know, a landlord isn't forced to extend a lease. A landlord is, in some jurisdictions, faced to uh, accommodate non-payment of rent, but they're not forced to sign an extension on certain terms. Um, most landlords I've seen want to wait this out, and are complying with the orders and they're doing what they can to try and get payment plans in place so they have some certainty, some security. But frankly, signing a long-term extension right now um, is often not in the best interest of either the landlord or the tenant. And so I think everyone's just trying to do temporary solutions. Um, and then we can circle back on that once this is over. Once this is over, a landlord can decide whatever they want to do, as can a tenant. Um, I've seen there might be some uh, internet connectivity issue or at least sound. So I'm going to go back a few slides here uh, and run through this. I think it's this one uh, that might have been a little unclear. We'll see. I'll, I'll get through. We'll see the attorney's draft language that can be used in a lease agreement extension to allow for a rent increase once they're allowed. And I'll just be quick. I'll say that we're evaluating all new forms that we hope are appropriate. Right now, we do not think it's time to be drafting an addendum to allow for future rent increases um, because that feels like a, a rent increase during the moratorium. So we're waiting to kind of play this by ear. Um, 
if, if it's still unclear, if this connection's a little garbled, I apologize. Um, I'm happy to talk afterwards and I'm not sure why that might be. Um, but feel free to submit questions in the Q&A if, if something's unclear or you cannot hear me. Last question, I think pre-submitted question. Um, if a lease is expiring, can an addenda be used to extend for two years without requiring a notary? No, you need a notary. Uh, and it doesn't matter which way you do it. Okay, Q and A. Audio is better now. Thanks. <laughs> That's good to hear. Appreciated. Um, audio keeps breaking up. Not so great, but that was before. So hopefully it's getting better. Okay. To clarify, uh, dentist hair or here, I'll just answer live. Uh, to clarify, dentist hair salon, nail salon, all in the same strip mall, unfortunately, are forbidden from opening. Okay, so do we not charge them rent? You cannot, since those are commercial businesses, you cannot increase rent. Assuming this is outside the city of Seattle, which we'll talk about soon. In that is the only commercial uh, language in effect statewide, which is you cannot increase rent for businesses uh, closed by, uh, closed due to COVID. And we'll go back to that right here. Commercial landlords are prohibited from increasing or threatening to increase rent or the amount of any deposit for tenants materially impacted by COVID-19. So you can still charge rent. Is notary considered, uh, sorry, is notary considered an essential service? Good question. Um, here's what I would say. Um, the governor passed the Electronic Notary Act, um, moved it up and passed it so that he doesn't have to field questions about whether notaries can go out in the world and get notarized signatures. Um, I have understood there that that is not that process has not been easy, has not been cheap, and so that's things. Those are things we are relaying to the governor, um, and I think other industry groups are too. Um, but as of now, no is is the unfortunate answer to that. They should not be acting outside of their home. They should not be going around. Um, the reason I paused initially is because closing transactions for people's homes, residential real estate, those still need to happen, which still need a notary. Um, so I'm not familiar with all the arguments associated with whether that could happen or not. But there, I do know that that's why the Electronic Remote Notary Act was put into effect early, is uh, to avoid notaries having to do it in person. Okay, uh, here's a long question. What do we do if we have a new lease that had a half month of rent due for the month before the order was issued or a free month of rent and now the lease rate is supposed to be a full? So I answered that question um, already and the idea is it's unclear, frankly. Um, there's an argument that the rent was already agreed upon beforehand and therefore that's not a unilateral rent increase, but that does constitute an increase in rent. So one has to ask, is that a violation of the order? Um, and that's a, a decision for the client to make with their uh, counsel. What do we do if an increase in rent uh, and triple nets due to property taxes? Can we bill those or wait till July? Same question for reconciliations. Yep, that's a great question. That's the million dollar question. Same as rent, frankly. Uh, triple nets are defined as rent within the lease, most likely. Uh, to me, you should be able to charge those. It's specifically anticipated that those will go up and down, uh, but they, are, they do constitute rent. So landlords should be very careful in how they handle this uh, so as not to violate the, the proclamation. 
Uh, if the tenant has a rent increase for April, May, or June, which is spelled out in the lease document, same answer there. I wish I could give you more black and white on this, but uh, as, you, as you've heard, we just don't have it. Okay, I think I answered those questions. Uh, would you go over what it means exactly that unpaid rent after 229 could not be considered an enforceable debt? Does that mean a tenant doesn't have to pay? Basically, yes. I, I don't, I am not a, a bankruptcy lawyer, not a collections lawyer. I don't know a lot about debts and collections. Um, so I, I don't, I don't want to be in over, uh, go out over my skis on this, but, but the idea is, is what you're getting at there is uh, te a tenant does not have to pay yet. Um, once this is passed and evictions are allowed, it's not like this money goes away. My understanding is you still as a tenant owe the payments. Um, and so in the short term, yes, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't give a tenant much relief when this months and months of rent start to pile up and suddenly they're all due uh, at some point in the not too distant future. Tenant failed to ask if an essential business. Tenant says governor office did not respond to the requests. Prove if this is so. Um, I mean, you, the, the governor provides great detail on what an essential business is. And so I think that's for both parties to take a look at and make a decision regarding and, and go forward there. Um, and then that impacts whether they, uh, you know, what you can do with a commercial tenant in terms of increasing rent. Tenant says they will not reopen until August, regardless of whether businesses are allowed to open. Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think we wait to see what happens. There's a lot between now and August that can change. The tenant can change their position. Um, if the emergency is lifted, and stay home, stay healthy is lifted, and businesses are allowed to go to are allowed to, to be open, um, there's likely an obligation within that lease that requires them to be open nine to five. And so they would be breaching that lease if they're not open. Uh, I wanna switch to Seattle here in the next minute or so because we're running low on time. Um, it said, it looks a comment here, it's understanding notaries are essential services. First American is doing curbside offices. I appreciate that. That is kind of my hesitation there as I know notaries are necessary to close real estate transactions and real estate transactions are allowed to close on the governor's order. Um, so that's good to hear. It's great. It's great to hear that's being done. I don't want to go too far in saying that's allowed or not. I, I reach out to First American about that. Um, I just know our conversations on our end has been, listen, that's why we have this electronic notary act and we've been trying to broaden what's been allowed. Uh, such as for notaries to go around and do this because it's been a tough system to use. Okay, so it sounds like page 21 is the one where there were some sound issues. So I'm gonna to touch on that and then I'll try to come back to the rest of the questions uh, at the end of the webinar where we might need to go over a little bit. Okay, here's 21. If a commercial tenant wants to get out of a legally signed contract, what is the usual penalty? Uh, so it's not a penalty. The damages are look at the lease that usually spells out uh, what sort of releasing expenses um, and other expenses that a landlord can recover. Then a landlord is allowed to recover rent from the tenant until a new tenant takes the space and starts paying. But that is limited by Washington law in case past cases, which say a landlord has to do so reasonably. They cannot turn down tenants. They cannot charge unreasonable lease terms. They cannot sit on their couch, even when it's allowed and required by the governor. Um, they've got to use efforts, reasonable efforts to try and find a replacement tenant. And even then they won't make a land uh, put a tenant on the hook indefinitely. Okay. City of Seattle, uh, and, and again, any questions I didn't quite get to, I'm sorry, I'll come to back to them at the end, but I wanna make sure within our scheduled time here that we get uh, to the city of Seattle as well. So here's a timeline in Seattle, which I won't spend a great deal of time on. I think it's interesting to see it in relation to the, what's in gray there is the overall state timeline. Um, Seattle acted fairly quickly uh, including you know, acting, uh, putting a moratorium on resident, residential evictions sooner. 
And then we saw the King County Sheriff, obviously outside, greater than Seattle, has put a moratorium on uh, enforcing eviction orders as well. And that all happened in March. On April 17, uh, very recently, we got a new set of legislation that applies to commercial tenancies, which is the other element that prompted this webinar. Uh, so I'll make sure to get and spend a little bit more time there than the other things. These things you should be familiar with if you're already a residential landlord or property manager because they've been in place since March 14, um, over a month now. And similar to the state level, cannot be evicted, cannot post eviction notices, cannot threaten lease termination, cannot charge late fees, um, all things that by now we are familiar with. Um, there are two sets of, um, or, of two ordinances that apply to small businesses. The first one came in March and that defines small business as basically anything with 50 or fewer employees, excuse me, 50 or fewer employees. And there they said you cannot evict them. And then it includes some other language about endeavoring into a payment plan, no accruing late charges and fees. And that's kind of the world we were operating under until this commercial tenancies ordinance came out. Uh, and this was, I believe, signed by the mayor on April 17th. And this much broader um, in some ways and, and it's narrower in other ways. So first and foremost, it only applies to small businesses and nonprofits. And nonprofits defined within the uh, ordinance uh, as what you see there, not-for-profit corporation, a nonprofit corporation, a public benefit corporation, uh, et cetera. But, we have a new and different definition of small business. And so this definition of small business uh, is what you wanna pay attention to, not just 50 or fewer employees, but instead you have to meet all of these conditions, owned and operated independently from other businesses, um, 50 or fewer employees per establishment. It must be either forced to close due to the governor's order or has gross receipts from the previous calendar month of 2020. So the question earlier about whether the tenant's essential or not, here, this is an either or. Even if it's essential, if its receipts are down, um, it's covered. And then finally, it cannot be a general sales or service business with 10 or more establishments, um, nor can it be an entertainment business with five or more establishments in the world. So what are the restrictions? So on small businesses and nonprofits, as those are defined, uh, you cannot increase rent during the lease term unless it was, author was authorized in a written lease in effect before the ordinance. Thank you, right? Now we have that clarity that, that we so desperately need on the state level. If it's a scheduled rent increase, if it's a triple net expense, that is all authorized in effect before the ordinance was in place. Now, if a lease is up, is expiring, you cannot renew it, and I would say you cannot extend it with a different or increased rent. Um, that's the second part there. It, note this does not apply to month-to-month -to -month tenancies. This is only to long-term um, extensions, renewals, things like that. Uh, some more limitations. Nonprofits and small businesses are allowed to pay rent in installments, which means if they don't pay rent, that's fine in Seattle. Um, they, can, they can set up a payment schedule and it, they can pay any time until six months after the emergency is declared over. Um, they do not have to pay back past due rent until one year after the civil, civil emergency is over and landlords cannot accrue or impose late fees and charges during that time. So in Seattle, late fees cannot accrue until, start to accrue until one year after the civil emergency is over. Uh, and then the final point here is unless the tenant agrees Otherwise, tenants are not required to pay more than one third of late rent within any month or period following the month for which full rent was not paid. So I'll get right into questions on that. Um, you see it's got more detail, but still be careful about what you're advising your clients. I wanna make sure I didn't miss anything here. Okay, great. What if my tenant is covered by the Seattle ordinance and does not pay rent? Um, well, that's, I think, pretty straightforward. You, you, have a, you, you try to negotiate a payment plan. They're allowed to pay with a payment plan. Um, you are allowed to do some things, um, which was a city that provided some guidance on this, like issue a billing statement or a letter, but you cannot go so far as to threaten anything. Termination of the lease, eviction, any sort of pay or vacate language is not allowed. Once this is over, if, if amounts have not been paid, um, 
within that one year, the landlord can issue a 14 day notice. What can I do if my tenant's rental agreement expires during the moratorium? You cannot start an eviction and that's really all you need to know. You should try in good faith to negotiate something in the short term that makes sense for all the parties. For triple net leases, does this mean tenants can pay operating expenses and in installments? Probably, because as I said earlier, operating expenses fall within the definition of rent. Um, so most commercial triple net leases define rent to include operating costs, costs uh, which means they're allowed to pay those most likely in installments. This is a, a good example of something I wish there, were more, there was more clarity on in the Seattle ordinance. A definition of rent would have been extremely helpful. If triple nets increase due to property taxes, can landlords bill that or do they have to wait? Same question for triple net re reconciliations when the tenant owes funds after the reconciliation. Um, if authorized by a lease already in effect, to pay, uh, in effect to pay triple nets, then you can pass those on. Um, that, is a, that is an increase that is specifically uh, contemplated by a lease already in effect. Uh, and again, remember, this only applies to small businesses and nonprofits, not all tenants. Uh, so make sure you're making the, your clients making that evaluation. Um, for reconciliations, again, I think it's authorized by the lease. And so therefore it, it would be allowed. It's not a late fee. It's not a late charge. If a subtenant gives notice for a five year extension prior to the emergency, but the sub lessor was obligated to respond with a new rate and has not, are the parties bound by the current rent? Need to look at the lease, frankly, um, and talk to a lawyer because the validity, the validity of the extension is still in question. It seems like it was exercised, but I just don't know. You won't know. And you really need a lawyer to take a look at the lease. You have a material term that has not yet been determined. So you can't have a lease without a material term such as rent. And you have questions like, does holdover rent apply? Does the past rent apply? Um, does force majeure apply and just buy, extend the lease at its current rate until you can get an appraiser out to do a fair market value of rent? Um, all things that need to be negotiated with the advice of counsel. Can the subtenant request the sub lessor renew the sublease at the same rate for five years? I mean, you can request anything. No one's obligated to do anything here though. Um, no one's, landlords not obligated to sign anything. They can agree to such an extension if they want. The sub lessors can agree to such an extension if they want. Um, you know, three-way relationships hard. Um, so <clears throat> you just need to work together and try to negotiate and keep in mind which protections are available to you. You cannot be, if you're a small business and you, you cannot be evicted, um, you're allowed to pay in installments. You cannot have your rent increased on renewal. So keep those things in mind as you're doing your negotiating. So a landlord's hamstrung a little bit in what they can do, but they're not, they're not obligated to sign a five-year extension uh, on certain terms. Can the government remove the state of emergency but still maintain restrictions on occupancy? I'm not a constitutional law expert. My understanding is yes, the Seattle ordinance is already providing for that in that you have until one year after the emergency is over to pay back uh, past due rent. So I would expect this, frankly. Um, if the city maintains restrictions or other sanctions, will the city's ordinance still apply? Yes. Nice and quick, so we're moving fast. Well, once the restrictions are lifted, how do we calculate late fees on past due rent? We touched on this earlier. Um, for small businesses and nonprofits, late fees cannot accrue until one year after the mayor declares the civil emergency over. I'm not an expert on residential stuff, but I, my understanding is residential tenants, late fees can accrue once the moratorium is lifted. They don't have that language in the commercial moratorium, but talk with a lawyer and make sure you're doing this right. And specifically somebody who does a lot of residential property management work. What are my rights in requesting commercial mortgage payment deferrals or interest only pay? I don't know. I'm sorry. I mean, th this is a banking question. Um, I've had clients who are able to get deferments, but deferring principal and interest for three months then creates big lump sum payment that's still due. So that it is temporary relief, but I'm not sure how much long-term relief it is. And I'm not familiar with all the things available to, uh, from a bank for lending purposes with legislation being passed federally. Okay.
we'll go to the Q&A and I'll just keep working through these. We're gonna go a few minutes over, it's fine with me. Uh, so please feel free to submit questions. After a little bit of time, I'll probably end it and ask you to follow up, uh, but we'll just kind of keep answering these as long as there are some questions in the queue. What if you had already initiated eviction an eviction action before February 29th for rents past due before the crisis? Unfortunately, you're in a tough spot. Um, the courts and the sheriff um, and the governor and the city of Seattle, at least for residential, uh, has put a moratorium on all enforcement of eviction orders. So if you don't have your judgment yet, you won't be able to get it. And even if you did, you would not be able to enforce it. Can notices of default be issued that are conditioned on what is allowed by the lease and under the law? Intent to do no with the intent to do nothing more than Void options to extend. Interesting. So what I would say is do not include language threatening eviction. You know, certainly if it's residential, do not include language um, threatening unlawful detainer. Do not include notice to vacate. Um, I, your, your, an attorney should craft this for you. It should not be crafted by a broker and it should say something along the lines of because the extension option was not validly exercised, uh, it no longer applies. And that's all that's being said, or it's no longer valid or cannot be relied upon. And you would wanna carve out that performance, you know, allowing the tenant to stay is not, uh, does not constitute, is with the permission of the landlord, does not constitute a compliance or a, uh, an implied willingness to grant the extension option, notwithstanding the fact that the tenant missed the exercise period. Doesn't the proclamation still affect non-essential commercial businesses tenants that are still open and not just those that are closed? The statewide proclamation, since using proclamation, I think you're talking about the governor, that says um, that you cannot increase rent on, business, on businesses that are materially impacted by COVID-19. Um, so that, you know, if, if, interpret that how you will. It appears to define that to say closed, but if you're an essential business that is, you can still make a strong argument that you're materially impacted, then you're likely, I think you, you're likely to have an argument under that provision that you cannot have rent increased. When can we start billing tenant for the amortized amount of deferred rent without looking like we're increasing rent? <laughs> without that. That's interesting. Um, it depends residential or commercial and it depends city of Seattle versus a state of Washington. Um, if you're a commercial tenant in the state of Washington, um, you can continue billing for unpaid rent throughout this period. You just cannot increase rent. And that means deferred rent, rent that's not paid, you can still collect. Um, in the city of Seattle, if it's a commercial tenant, you gotta make sure I get all this straight. If it's a commercial tenant, uh, they have the right to make a payment plan. Uh, that doesn't mean the rent goes away, it becomes deferred rent. They have a right to pay uh, pursuant to that payment plan and defer payments, uh, well, let me be real clear. They can be late on rent or not pay rent during the moratorium and within, within six months after. They have to pay all past due amounts by one year after the civil emergency is over. Um, so that's when you'd start accruing late fees and things, but that would be the deadline to pay the deferred rent. Is SIBA reaching out to the governor's office or the attorney general to answer these questions? Yes. Um, there's all the several different industry groups uh, that SIBA is very involved with, um, who are we, as counsel and as lobbyists on behalf of SIBA and on behalf of other industry groups are working day, daily with lobbyists who are working with the governor. Uh, to try and get answers to these questions, as well as try to, uh, to do other things that we think we can do safely um, within the public, like some commercial brokerage operations. Uh, here's a comment, again, this is great. Old Republic title has notaries completing signings using safety precautions, such as distancing masks, gloves, hand sanitizers. That's great, that's great to hear. And I can understand, as I said earlier, the reasoning for that. Will you send a PDF of the slides after this? And will you send a pre-recorded version of this? Yes, we will. 
Um, I'll submit the slides to SEBA and then the webinar and the slides will be available uh, later, maybe early next week, if not uh, later this week, or I guess later today. Aha, it sounded like your answers to 44 and 45 contradicted each other. Could you go over that again? Absolutely, I'm glad that you pointed that out. Let's see if I said something wrong. Okay, 44. Can the government remove the state of emergency but still maintain restrictions on occupancy or other, occup uh, other sanctions for bars and restaurants? So the answer there was yes. Um, I expect some social distancing stuff to be in a place, to be in place going forward. And we've seen the city of Seattle be willing to uh, enforce limitations that apply, clearly contemplate applying after the state emergency has been lifted, uh, such as the obligation to pay rent back and late fees. So that's 44. 45 says, if the city maintains restrictions or other sanctions for bars and restaurants, will the city's ordinance still apply? So contradict. I mean, so the, maybe I'm just not interpreting the question right. The city's ordinance, uh, uh, the term of how it applies is already defined by the ordinance itself or as it's extended. So we know, for example, that it applies during the civil emergency. We know that certain aspects of it apply even after the civil emergency is over. Um, and those might be changed by the mayor, depending on what the governor decides businesses can or cannot do. Um, so the city's ordinance on commercial tenancies and evictions and rent increases will continue to apply during its term, which is tied to the state of emergency. If the state of emergency is lifted, the ordinance is still applying, right? We still have a tail period, and there may be further guidance uh, that provides further relief for bars and restaurants that are still facing restrictions, even though the emergency has been applied. Um, so we'll just need to see that. Hopefully that's a little bit clearer. I also hope that the internet connectivity or, or sound or anything like that worked. Um, but that's all the questions we've got in the Q&A. Uh, if there are any more, um, please don't be afraid to email me, hunter.jeffers at stole.com and also reach out to SEBA. They, they're terrific at handling questions and I'm happy, happy to help in any way I can. And I got a comment, sound is still great from Nicolette. Thank you, that's great to hear. I'm sure not hearing me for a little while wasn't the worst thing in the world. Uh, it's a lot of talking. So I will hand it back over to Kristen now. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I hope to hear from some of you if I can be helpful. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Hunter, thank you for your presentation. We do appreciate it. And as Hunter mentioned, if you didn't get your question answered or if the sound quality was poor when your question was being um, talked about, please feel free to reach out to Hunter and he'll be happy to uh, clarify that for you. So once again, thank you very much for attending. Have a good afternoon.